Good morning, everyone. I'm going to ask you to give me a hand raise if you can hear me. Good, very good. Ooh, seeing those numbers climb, love it. You know, we're just about one or two minutes away from the program for ju Junior Ranger or Virtual Junior Ranger program called I Spy, Observing Things in Nature. So if you haven't already, you can go ahead and grab the materials that we're going to need for our craft, for our nature necklace today. And I'll say this again when everyone's here, but for those of you that are already ready to go, you're going to need some yarn, paper, a glue stick, colored pencils, if you have them, and if you know, don't, it's okay, a pen or pencil. I think that's it. But I'll remind you all a little bit later. I'm going to step away and let you look at the beach while we're waiting just for a couple more minutes to get everybody joining or welcome them in. Guys, if you just joined us, we are at San Alejo State Beach for our virtual Junior Ranger program called I Spy, How to Observe Things in Nature. If you just joined us, we are going to do a craft later on. And if you haven't already, you want to try to grab some string or yarn, some paper, glue stick, scissors. I think I forgot that last time. And colored pencils or something to draw with. It's a cloudy day today. Probably later on this afternoon, this marine layer, what we call the marine layer, will move back offshore. We call it burning off. And it probably will be sunny later on this afternoon but I hope you're already beginning to use your observation skills to notice this gorgeous beach behind me. How many of you have been to San Alejo State Beach? If you have, raise your hand. It's in San Diego. A few of you, I'm seeing some some people that have visited, that's great. We're in San Diego County in North County. Looks like not a huge number of you have been here, so that's kind of neat that you are able to join us today. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And again, I am Sandy, an interpreter with California State Park. And we are here for our virtual Junior Ranger program. I think maybe we're the third or fourth of the series for the summer. So it's exciting to be here. I have a short but important message. And prior to the program, I washed my hands for 30 seconds with warm water. And so I sanitize all of this equipment that we'll be using today prior to the program and after the program. We're going to clean everything again, sanitize it. I'll wash my hands again. I'm going to avoid touching my face. If I sneeze or cough, I want to do that inside my arm or if I have a tissue, even better. If I get too close to anyone, I want to remember it's at least six feet. And I do have some cones placed here to remind folks that we're trying to maintain our safe distance from each other. Normally I would be wearing a mask in the campground, but I have had special uh, permission to go without the mask while I'm delivering the program. But again, we are social distancing, all right? So I have a question to ask, wait, oh my gosh, did you see that? Well, if you didn't, it's okay. Remember, that's what we're here for today, to improve our observation skills. 
to improve our chances of being able to spot something unique in nature. By the way, I have a question for you. What is the most interesting thing that you have ever seen when you're out in nature? So you can share that with someone that you're with enjoying the program, or if you're by yourself, you can maybe jot it down. You know, I had to think a minute or two about this, and I came up with one sighting that was just wonderful. And I was hiking with a group of hikers up on a ridge, and we were in Orange County, and I heard something first, and I heard this whoosh, this giant raptor. It had that little hooked beak like a hawk does and a wingspan that was wider than my outstretched arms. It was dark brown, and all I remember is it being dark and big and so smooth as it glided over us. And there was a naturalist with us, and she confirmed it was a golden eagle. So I hope you have seen some really cool sightings. Raise your hand if you had an interesting sighting. You know, some of you are only seven years old or maybe even younger. And so you haven't been around as long as I have. So you are going to see those things. And the more you're observing, like good scientists and good naturalists, which are, I guess, often can be the same thing, then you're going to see more unique sightings. I love that. So what's happening in the program today? We have about 45 minutes together. And if we go a little bit over that, it's okay. But we are planning on talking about how to improve our skills to identify plants, to observe nature, also to combat something called the green blur. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Sounds kind of mysterious. And then we're going to make the nature necklace and finally, at the end, we're going to play a game called I Spy With My Little Eye. And I know you have probably played that game before. I love that. So I wanna talk about, I'm gonna go, actually, I'm gonna go back in time for a minute. I want to go back a few hundred years. And I want you to think about the Native Americans that used to live here in San Diego County. And they're, the, they were the kumeyaay for the most part right here. And they had to rely on nature. They didn't have a pharmacy. They didn't have a grocery store. A lot of the conveniences that we have today, they did not have. So they had to know their plants, right? Some plants they knew were good for food. They were edible. Some plants might be poisonous and could make them sick or give them a rash or just be really painful. And then some had medicinal purposes. For example, did you know that you can take honey for a scrape or a, a minor cut, and you can put honey over that, and it acts as kind of like a natural Band-Aid. It has antibacterial properties. If you take bark from a willow tree, and you boil that in a tea in a beverage and drink it, it can get rid of your headaches. But I'm going to ask you not to try that, please. You, you need to know how to do that. And at this point, you don't. So please don't try to drink the tea. But manufacturers, companies will take an ingredient from that bark and they do manufacture aspirin, what we know today as a pain reliever. So we can see that plants can provide a lot of needs for us, but there's a new phenomenon and it's called the green blur. And what that is, is it's an, an, a, a human's ability or inability to be able to distinguish between plants, vines, trees, bushes. They can't tell the difference. And we're going to walk over here for a minute and I wanna show you 
this area that looks a little like what I'm talking about. It looks a little bit like a green blur. You might see this fencing down here and this fencing, you know what, give me one second. I think I'm gonna change our view here. Let's do this. It should give you a little clearer picture. There we go. So you're going to see, oh, I just saw, it looked like a dragonfly actually. Very interesting. Keep your eyes out while we're looking at this patch of green blur because there's a lot going on. And I know it's probably hard for you all to see the flying creatures. There's bumblebees here and there's, I saw yesterday a bunny, but I'm not sure if he's still around. But back to the green blur. So modern day folks, when we go out into the woods, if we don't know how to identify plants, we're just going to see this big wall of green. And that's what we wanna help come back today. So we're hopeful that by the end of our program today, you're gonna to be able to distinguish between the plants and you won't have to worry about the green blur. All right. We're gonna head back over to our original spot here. We're trying to, again to distance ourselves from everybody in the campground. So I want to show you a leaf and you know what let me grab one it's not from our oh by the way the slope that you were looking at is all native plants and they have restored this area and again that's the fencing is is to let people know not to get too close but let me grab I'm going to grab a, we, a leaf of a weed I'll be right back So you're going to take a look at this leaf and I'm going to get it a little close up for you and hopefully you can see that. So this leaf is, would you say it's narrow or it's wide? If you think it's narrow, I want you to give me a hand raise. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Gosh, we have over 100 people today. I love that. Maybe even, oh yeah, the numbers are going up. All right, narrow. Uh, yeah, you guys were correct, absolutely. So definitely this is narrow. So size is one of the things we do to look at different, um, to differentiate or differences between plants. So we can also see that on the edge, it has an uneven edge. It's almost like a little bit called serrated, where it has a little bit of a design. And I'll try to let you see that up close. Trying to hold it still so you'll autofocus. Well, maybe back there. All right, good. So these are things we're looking for. Color, we're also looking for how they are on the stem. So if there are, a, if there is a leaf on either side of the stem, we would say that that was bilateral. If there's one here and one down here, that they're alternating. So how the leaf is on the stem also helps you to identify a plant. Really cool, very good. And that's just some of the ways. You know, flowers, being able to see the flower of a plant can help you identify. And we are gonna go back to our little slope over here. And I want you to hopefully see these cool, you know what, let me flip it again. Sorry guys, I want you to see it with the best camera angle or best view possible. And there are, the poppies. That's our native flower. That's the state flower. And it, it is a native. When I say native, it means it belongs here. That it's drought tolerant. It might be fire resistant. Usually they are fire resistant. And those are super, oh, sorry guys. I'm going to get you back my way. So native plants are going to be more fire resistant. They're going to be more a drought, like I said, drought tolerant, so they don't need a lot of water, right? So that's some of the ways to look at plants. Now, I have something else I want to show you. You know, we mentioned that some of the plants might be poisonous. So let's take a look. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, I'm going to go to... Whoop. 
So this first plant that you're seeing, um, raise, your hand, raise your hand really quick and tell me, do the leaves look smooth or do they look wrinkled? So if you think they look smooth, raise your hand. Oh, I love it. No, very few raising their hands. You're right, they're wrinkled. So if you think they're wrinkled, raise your hand. Let's get it in there. Woo -hoo. You're right. So they are wrinkled, and I'm, there might be a more scientific way to describe that, but for us today, we're saying they look wrinkled, and that's true. This is called stinging nettle, and I want you to look at the leaves. If you think they're broad leaves, raise your hand. Absolutely. Definitely broad leaves. Remember, we talked about that. Look at the edges. Observe the edges. And you'll see, I'm going to see if I can get a little closer. There you go. Look at the edges. Do they look smooth or do they look bumpy or serrated or we can even say scalloped looking? So are they uneven? Are they smooth on the edge? No. They're definitely showing us some kind of a little pattern there. These are also fuzzy. And when I say fuzzy, that's the, what I would call the texture and they have little prickles on them, and you can see those prickles close up. I'm gonna close up, give you another view one more time. You can see those prickles on the right. That is what helps us get stung. And that's what we say. We actually say you are stung by stinging nettles because it feels like fire. It really does. I've been stung by stinging nettle. If I had my choice, I'd rather be stung. Ooh. This is a big decision. I'd rather be stung by a jellyfish than a stinging nettle because the jellyfish sting only lasts for me anyway, a couple of hours. And the stinging nettle lasts for about 20 hours. And it just feels like explosions of little pain coming from this plant. So you wanna avoid it, right? It grows up to four feet high, but generally when I've seen it, it's been lower, maybe a foot or foot and a half. And it comes in bunches usually. It reminds me of, and I want you to see if it reminds, to ask you if it reminds you of anything else. One thing it reminds me of is mint. When I see wild mint or the, the flavoring mint, it comes in a plant form. Love that. All right. So the next plant I want to show you is called poison oak. Now, if you live in California, you have probably met this special plant. And if you have seen this, it's the darker green on the right. If you've seen this plant, raise your hand. Oh, a lot of you have, that's great. You know, it's definitely going to be in areas where there are oak trees. And the, tr and the leaves on the left are actually oak tree leaves. And so we're going to do a comparison here between the two. And scientists will do that to notice more differences and sometimes similarities as well. This is a form of a green blur, right? So if you look on the right, I'm going to zoom us in again. Here is our poison oak. I want you to notice it. I want you to see if it reminds you of anything else. And does it make you wonder anything? Now I'm asking you those three questions. Those are our famous observation science questions. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So first of all, I notice, me, I notice that those are shiny leaves. If you notice that too, raise your hand, that these leaves are shiny. And believe me, it's not just a reflection from the sun. They're definitely shiny. They don't have any fuzz on the leaf. So that, that top part that you see there, and you can't touch it, I know, but if you touched it, which you don't want to, it would not be fuzzy. It would just be smooth. There's a stem, and I'm gonna kind of lower that, the skinny stem, and it's a reddish color. And then the last thing I want you to notice about this are the way the leaves are attached to the stem. Remember we talked about bilateral, we talked about alternating, 
And then there's also this group of three leaves together. So you can see one, two, three leaves. And have any of you heard of a famous warning about poison oak? Raise your hand if you've heard this warning. And I know you're wanting to tell me, and I'm sorry you can't tell me, my good junior rangers. But if you've been camping at all, I'm sure you've heard this. Leaves, L-E-A-V-E-S, leaves of three, let it be. Say that with me. Leaves of three, let it be. One more time. I didn't say that too well. Leaves of three, let it be. Good. And I hope you remember that. So that's how we remember poison oak. And just another reminder, it produces an oil. And you can brush your pant leg on it. And, you know, you probably would be okay if you washed your pants right away. But if you happen to brush your hand on your pant leg and uh, even touched your face, then you're definitely going to develop a rash on your hand and your face from poison oak. So you'll always want to shower thoroughly, wash your hair, do the tick check, all of those good safety measures when you've been out in nature, right? So now we want to compare this to the oak tree leaf. You guys are doing a great job on your observation skills. I'm going to move down just a little bit. So you can see the two together. And I want you to tell me if you think the oak tree leaves look shiny too, raise your hand. So do they, are they both shiny? That's what I'm asking you. Exactly. They both have that sheen to them. And so that's something that they have in common. It's similar. But now you're going to see, we're going to kind of focus on our oak, oak excuse me, our oak leaf right there. And I want you again to notice the edge of the leaf. Do you see anything different on the edge of the leaf here that we did not see on our poison oak leaf? If you see something different on the edge, raise your hand. Oh, good. I'm seeing lots of you. And you can see, and I know again you want to tell me, but I'll say it for you. Prickles is what I would call little points right here on the edge. And if you feel an oak leaf, and you can definitely touch them, they have no poisonous properties. And you can feel the little prickles on the end, those little points. And the, yeah, they could hurt you if you like stabbed your finger on it, but you don't want to do that. So that's a type of green blur we said, but now you've overcome the green blur because you've been able to distinguish between the plants. And there's even more than two, but we're not going to have time to look at all that today. But very cool. All right. Okay, so guess what we're going to do now? We're going to get ready to go. Oh, wait, I have one more thing to tell you. I forgot about that. We, we're honing and improving our observation skills for plants. But you know what? Often plants are interacting with animals, or we can say animals are interacting with plants. And sometimes you'll hear leaf litter, and, but it's not the leaf litter. You know, that's the stuff that falls onto the, the forest floor or um, just you'll see piles of it under trees and so forth. And it's dead leaves and dead twigs and things like that. So you'll hear maybe a light scratching sound, scratch, 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 scratch. And what do you think that might be? If you have an idea of what that little creature is that's scratching underneath the oak tree in the leaf litter, raise your hand if you think you know what that is. I bet you do. It's going to be a bird, right? Could be a scrub jay, a beautiful blue scrub jay. And it could be the little, um, oh, like the towies and some other uh, native birds that we have scratching, looking for things to eat. Then what happens if you hear a crunch, 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 and maybe a twig snaps? What could that be? Do you think that's a bigger animal? Raise your hand if it's a crunch, crunch, and then you hear a twig break. Twig, snap. Oh yeah, definitely. This is going to be, well, it could be a couple of different things. It could be a bobcat, it could be a skunk waddling along, but 
It could be a deer, like a mule deer or a black-tailed deer further up north. And so you don't know what you might spy interacting with the plants. You might hear this, tap, 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 tap. And maybe it's above you. Do you have any idea what that might be? Tap, tap, tap. And you're looking up. That's another way to observe things, is to look up or to keep your eyes looking down as well. But what do you think this is? Tap, tap, tap. Oh, I know you know what it is. I see lots of hands raising. A acorn woodpecker or a downy woodpecker, but some kind of a woodpecker or tree clinger. They're going to be on the side of the tree. Tap, 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 tap. And that's a way by using sound that you can locate something that you don't even see at first. So sound is always a good way to notice wildlife. You could hear a buzzing or a whirring, or like me, remember I saw that golden eagle? So that's a good way to observe. And of course your eyes sometimes smell. You know, think about skunks. They do emit a, spe a smell, some beetles stink bugs, they emit sm smell. So you're using as many senses as you can. The one, the one sense I ask you not to use when you're looking for wildlife is your sense of touch. You don't ever want to reach into a dark crevice or a pile of rocks. You never want to lift up the rocks with your bare hands. You don't do that. You don't ever want to, if you're in a garage, just, just another little side, aside is you don't want to reach into a dark corner inside either indoors because there could be critters there and you never want to startle anything in nature no wildlife should be startled they get stressed out now let's focus on the sea for a minute we're going to turn toward the ocean and you can look at it while i'm talking a little bit more there and I want you to think about even at the ocean, you don't want to reach into the bottom of a rack of seaweed. We'll talk about seaweed more in a minute, but you don't want to because there could be crabs in there and you're going to get snap little pinch on there. Or you could, there could be sand fleas or sand flies. I'm moving just a little bit. You'll notice that we're getting a few more folks around and that's okay. So, um, yeah, so this is ways that we're noticing wildlife and how you want to stay safe when you are noticing wildlife. Another thing that you wanna do is make sure that you leave enough space between you and the creature that you see. For example, if you get too close and they feel threatened, it's gonna take them energy. They're either gonna run away and they're gonna change their normal routine or they're gonna hide and that takes energy. But what you're doing is you're throwing them off their normal routine. And they might miss a whole morning of foraging for food or sometimes a whole day if they, get, if they run too far away from their normal routine or their, uh, their uh, regular uh, path that they go on. So again, you wanna give, whether you're at the beach or in the woods, you wanna give wildlife enough space and not stress them out. And it's better for you because you're going to stay safe. You know. Always, as you're walking down the trail, too, one more little safety thing about observing nature. You want to look ahead of you on the trail. Stay on the trail. Everybody, any naturalist, any guide, any leader for uh, the scouts or even our learning in our virtual junior ranger programs, you're going to stay on the trail, right? But you want to make sure that you're looking ahead. The times that I've seen snakes the most, I've seen probably nine or 10 snakes in my hiking career. And you wanna make sure, they've always been laid out. They've never been in a coiled striking position. They've always been laid out and very chill. And, but, but if you're not looking and you're gawking and not paying attention, talking and, and not aware, you could step on them. And that definitely would put them in a defensive mode and you risk getting bitten. Otherwise, you can back up slowly. You can give them plenty of space and walk around them. And, and I assume you'll be with an adult and then you, you deal with it according to how the adult wants to, but you never crowd any wildlife, right? All right. I know I got my point across. Lots of stuff. So why do you think it's a good idea? I'm going to back up one a little bit here. Got a couple questions for you. And, you, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Why do you think it might be a good idea to be able to identify 
certain types of wildlife or back even to our plants? Why is it a good idea to be able to identify them? So raise your hand. Let's, I know you can't tell me the reasons, but how about this? If you think it's a good idea to be able to identify plants and wildlife, raise your hand. Let's do that. I love that. Oh my goodness, of course. And some of the reasons, I'm going to just give you a minute. You think about some of the reasons why. Either why you want to identify plants, why you want to identify wildlife, or both. So take a minute right now, share with your partners, share with your family members, or write your answers down. One of the reasons that you might say is to avoid poisonous plants. You don't want to get a rash or get stung from a plant. So raise your hand if that was one of the things you thought of, because you don't want to get poisoned. That's right, from our stinging nettle or our poison oak. And there's other poisonous plants too. Oh yeah. So how many of you thought of the idea as far as the wildlife that you want to be able to identify them so you know, for example, is it a gopher snake or is it a rattlesnake? And you'll know that the gopher snake is not venomous, but the rattlesnake is. And of course you want to stay a good distance from all wildlife, right? But it's nice to know if one is venomous, right? Especially if, God forbid, you were bitten by one, right? And that does not happen. You know how most, I'm gonna, just a quick aside, most people get bit by rattlesnakes or other venomous snakes or other snakes here on their hand because they're reaching in to try to poke them or aggravate them or tease them. That's how most people get bitten by snakes. So I just want you to know snakes are definitely very scared of you. They don't want to confront you either. So if you give everybody their own space, awesome. All right, I bet you came up with some other reasons why too, but we, oh, and also to overcome the green blur, right, for our plants. So I know we kind of jumbled those two things together, but that's okay. Oh, and I'm seeing a monarch butterfly. Oh, and I don't know, she just flew away. Not sure if you're gonna get to see her. She's gorgeous, gorgeous, love that. So we're gonna head down to the beach right now. We're going to be making our nature necklace. So if you haven't had a chance to grab your materials, we're going to talk about that as we walk down to the beach. So if you haven't yet grabbed your paper, yarn or string, grab your scissors to carefully, remember point side down, and let me think, did I forget anything? If you have color pencils, great. Painter pencil to draw. You know, scientists use grids to research and collect data. And we're going to set up, or we've already set up something called a quadrat. Now, I'm going to talk to you about this. Give me a minute. I'm adjusting my tripod so give me a minute scientists use these grids to collect data and maybe they want to know how many pieces of seaweed are on the beach in a large area but they don't have time to to check the whole area so what they'll do is they'll make a a quadrat with a Q divide it into grids or squares, and they'll take one sample, what we call a sample, and then they will use that to kind of estimate what they would have seen had they counted all of the bits of seaweed or piles of seaweed on the whole beach. So they'll use this as a sample. And so we're gonna be scientists today and we're looking at our quadrat. 
And these are the things that you're going to choose to draw. Now, you're going to choose three things. If you have, if you know you're more of a detailed, slower drawer, drawer, you may want to pick three things. If you're kind of fast and you can sketch things pretty quickly, you may want to choose four or as many as you have time for. But I'm going to give you about four or five, or no, I'd say at least six minutes to draw some of these items. And you're going to draw them on one of your pieces of paper. So let me show you really quickly what you're going to do. So you want to have about three or four pieces of paper that are about three inches by about one and a half. And it doesn't have to be perfectly like this, but this is called a rectangle, and this is what we're going to use to draw pictures of the items that are in the quadrat. So cut about three of those. You can actually fold a large piece of paper, a regular sized piece of paper in half. You could fold it in half and then cut a few of these out. It, it doesn't matter, and they don't have to be perfect. That's the fun thing about crafts is they can be your creation. So you're going to be drawing it. Now this is important or you won't be able to see the picture. So you want to fold it in half vertically like this, up and down. And this is where you want to draw your picture. And that's because you're going to be attaching it in a little while, not yet. We're going to be attaching it to the yarn or the string. And you want to be able to see your picture right here, right? So remember, here is what it looks like when you cut it out, fold it this way, and now you're going to start drawing pictures that you see here in the quadrat. So, or items. So any of these items that you see, you can draw. So go ahead and start doing that. I'm going to say one more time, you can choose three or four items that you see in the quadrat. One picture per paper. So go ahead and work on that for a minute, and then I'm going to go through each one of these items and tell you about them. You may want to quickly sketch the three or four items that you want to draw because at, in a few minutes, before the end of the time, I'm going to be talking about each one individually and giving you some details. But you want to try to draw them in the location. If you were a, if you were a scientist, you would want to draw them in the location that you found them. But because we're just doing these random drawings for our, our necklace, it doesn't really matter. You can draw them in any order that you want to, and it doesn't, you know, they don't have to be one big giant picture with all these little items on them. So in case you can't tell, I am going to point out there's an item right here. There's one here, 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 there.
Okay, guys, I'm still here. Raise your hand if you're still here. Raise your hand. Oh, good. I know you're concentrating. I love that. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now, you guys are still, you all are still continuing your drawing. I'm going to be showing you one item at a time and giving you a little bit of information about each item. So it's kind of, kind of fun. So this, I know you probably know if you've been to the beach before. This would be something that you would see in a pile of seaweed. And you know, the seaweed is another type of a green blur, blur, right? So there could be different types of kelp. There could be something else that I'm going to show you in a minute called surf grass. But you can see the details on this one. You can see the little gas bladders. So this is definitely something called algae, but we also call it kelp. It's not actually a plant. They can breathe through their blades on the algae. They can, uh, they can breathe in the water. This would be definitely growing in the water. And then when it gets ripped up or moved from currents for whatever reason, it shows up here as seaweed. You know, California State Parks does not remove seaweed from the beach. And it's very important because a lot of creatures rely on seaweed. And again, it's that mix of different types of plants. Here's another plant that we find in our seaweed. And that pile of seaweed, there's another word for it. Raise your hand if you know another word. It starts with a W. That is another word for seaweed. Oh, wow, I'm, I'm very impressed. So this, the word is rack, W-R-A, C-K, rack. And so the seaweed stays, this, oh, this is actually surf grass right here. I apologize. But the surf grass would be part of that seaweed. And a lot of birds and other creatures like decomposers are sea sand fleas and are sand flies. I've even seen um, ladybugs, whole big uh, nests of ladybugs in seaweed before, but they were beaches that didn't have a lot of human activity. Um, anyway, but this is surf grass. This is a super important habitat here at Swami's MPA, and it's one of the reasons why it was selected, uh, because this habitat is home to juvenile fish. It's it gives them protection, home to some invertebrates or, or many crustaceans, and there's a very special friend of ours called the green sea turtle that loves to eat surf grass. So this is what it looks like. All right. Now I'm going to show you yet another type of kelp. This I think is the giant kelp. Let's take a look at it. So you see the gas bladder that actually helps them to float. Here's the gas bladder. And here's one of the, the broad uh, leaves here. There's more. And these can get very, very large. Or this is a blade. I'm sorry, not a leaf, a blade. There you go. There's actually another piece of it right here. If you drew that, that's OK. That's perfect. That's fine. Now I have two things. Oh, wait. I'm so sorry, I'll get this up and close to you. To see, notice, what do you see on this? This is obviously a feather. And how is it different than some of the other items we've seen? Well, first of all, this comes from an animal. It does come from nature, so we can say it's biotic. You can see the different palm fronds, or excuse me, the different feathers. Kind of reminds me of a palm frond, actually. And you know what? We do have seabirds here and shorebirds, and the, the seaweed is important to them. I want you to take a minute from 
your drawing. Just one minute. Put your hands together like this. And I want you to imagine that there is an adult snowy clover bird sitting right in your hands like that. That bird, look how tiny he is. That bird is a special bird that lives, he doesn't live here at San Alejo, but he definitely visits here. And we're hopeful at some point he or she will be making a nest and taking care of their young again in these beaches right here at Swami's MPA. That's our goal. We're uh, very hopeful for that. Do you know the male, the dad, we just celebrated Father's Day, and the male snowy plovers, they take the care of the chicks more than the females. The females lay the eggs. They're there off and on for a little while, and then they take off. And really, the dads are the ones that take care of the chicks more so as they're uh, getting ready to fledge and go out on their own. So that's kind of a different way that the plovers do. But they are of a concern. That means that their numbers are dropping. And like so many animals and, and organisms, what happens is they lose their habitat or their home. And so that's why it's so important to protect places like the dunes and like uh, swamis and so forth to for our snowy plover and our other creatures that live here. So here are two things that we were drawing. And I want you to let me know if you think they're both shells or pieces of shell, I want you to raise your hand. You know what? I, I can see why you would think that. And you can't really hold it in your hand right now, so you can't tell. But I want you to notice, this is a shell. It's very sturdy. If I would snap it in half, it would crack and break, more like a plate, something that was ceramic. But this, I want you to see, if I would go like this to the other shell, it would break. Do you see how it's flexible? Can you guess what this is? Raise your hand if you think you know what this is. If you've been on a beach cleanup with me here, then you would know what that is. Raise your hand. Oh, I think a lot of you are thinking styrofoam. Oh my, dun, dun, dun. Styrofoam is bad. Guys, it does not biodegrade at all. It never goes back to the earth. It cannot be composted and it cannot be recycled. So please, don't use styrofoam cups at your July 4th gatherings. Encourage your parents not to buy styrofoam cups or plates, to, not to use plastic, one-time use plastics like forks and knives, because you use them once, you put them in the trash, and they most likely don't get recycled. They just go to the landfill and get covered up in the earth, and they stay there and stay there and stay there. So please ask them, hey, can we use, I'll wash, mom, I'll help wash the forks, I'll help wash the plates. Let's just use our own plates and, and uh, cups and silverware, and then we don't have to use any plastic like this bad styrofoam, right? So cool. So we've had a good amount of time, I think, for you to draw. And I know, you know what, I know I, some of the things I didn't put right back in the same place, but Let's go back to our craft, and I'll show you how to make this necklace. Some of you may have already figured it out. I'm being a little a bit of a pokey puppy to get, get you going. If you've already figured it out, go for it. So one thing I want to show you is you're going to take that picture, picture side toward you, and you're going to get your string, and you want to take that, remember we folded it, we folded it and then here's the picture. So picture side toward you, you're going to be laying it over the, the string or the yarn, whatever you could find, we don't care, it's okay. And now you're gonna take the glue stick. So get the glue stick out and you're going to be gluing the two inside flaps of the paper 
So that way it's going to be blank on one side. Hey, later on, if you want to add another uh, drawing, go for it. But your picture's here, you're pasting, putting the glue stick on the inside, kind of like it was an envelope, and then you want to pinch it and hold it for five seconds or 10 seconds, just to make sure that glue is really sticking and getting set. So that's one picture, but you want to add a couple of more pictures. And if you remember what my necklace looked like, and I will show you again, you can see my necklace. Hope you can, all right? So that's what it's going to look like. Now, when you tie it, you wanna make sure it's not hanging too low. Usually about 20 to 24 inches is good. And you want to try it on over your head to make sure you've made it big enough. And then when you're ready, and you can do this before or after you try it on your neck, that's fine. You're going to take two pieces like this at the end, and you can tie it any way you want to, but the way I do it is I hold both pieces, I wrap it around my finger, push it through, and then I tie it like that. And you might want to do it light, and then if you have to adjust it to make it longer or shorter, you can untie it to do that. Okay? So I hope that you've got your nature necklace ready to go. Go ahead and attach any of the pictures that you made so far. We have about one more minute, and then we're going to get ready to play I Spy with My Little Eye. How many of you have played that game before, I Spy With My Little Eye? Raise your hand if you have. Quite a bit of you, very cool. So remember, just a reminder, I'm going, I'm going to be it only because you guys can't talk, but um, I will be it and I'm going to give you some hints about some different things that we're looking at here at San Alejo State Beach. And I'm gonna, we're gonna be moving away from the quadrat right now. And you're finishing up your nature necklace. And give me a minute to kind of adjust the camera just a bit. There we go. So here we are now looking at the beach again. It's still cloudy. I'm going to just set something on. Give me one second, just adjusting something so it doesn't blow away. All right. So let's find something to spy. All right. So by the way, this is a cliff right here at the beach. And I want to remind everybody, you do not climb on cliffs. I'm going to be very stern about this. It's very dangerous to climb on a cliff. And it's very destructive to nature to write or scratch your name or carve your name into a cliff or even a tree. We just don't do that. It's disrespectful to the environment, to the earth. When you stay off of the cliff, they're unstable. You can see the jagged edges and the way it jets in and it goes back out. The, the holes that are in the little caverns, like the little caves. And that happens because of, and I bet you know, erosion, right? How many of you knew it was through erosion that causes these cliffs to uh, break down and become unstable? Absolutely. So we stay off of it. All right, back to the game, guys. So I'm spying something on this cliff, and I am going to show you the area. So it's something within this area that you see. And it has some stairs. It has a flat something or other over the top, has lots of windows. If you see what I'm describing, raise your hand. Oh my goodness, everybody sees it. Well, guess what? That is our brand new lifeguard headquarters. It's a brand new building. It took more than a year to build, and it's a special place for our lifeguards to guard 
people who are out on the beach to take care of them and keep everyone safe. Cool. Oh, 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 I just saw a really cool, I spy something flying in the air. I hope you got to see it. That was a seagull. All right. So we're going to look at this area. This is your next area to find something. I'm going to say, this is easy. It is in the shape of a square, but the square is at a different angle than you would normally notice. So see if you buy something like that. It's a square. It is of a certain color. I will say it's of a, a certain color, but it's tilted sideways to look more like something we would call a diamond. Oh, I think you're guessing it. So it's this sign. It's this danger sign. And I think you can see it. It says, whoops, unstable cliff, stay back. All right. Let's go out to the water and see what we see. So I'm spying. You know what? I'm going to go this. You can see all the kids are playing. The dog is not supposed to be in the water, guys. So I'm spying something green. There's more than one. The water just almost covered it. And let me go back that way. Do you spy that? If you know what it is, raise your hand. It's something green. It's in kind of a mound, and it's on the beach. There you go. Let's get a little closer and we'll see what it looks like. So the water's coming in, so I'm not going to get too close. But you can see the seaweed. And again, that's a type of a green blur. But we talked about seaweed already. You know what? This is mostly giant kelp right here. And I want you to notice. Notice the different parts, the color, the shape. Notice the water interacting with it. Very cool. And remember, we don't take the seaweed off the beach. And I want you to see up close, here is more seaweed. Can you see the surf grass? Raise your hand if you see the surf grass here. Very true. It's another type of green blur, but you can see the grass, sea grass. All right, one last thing. So we're headed back this way. And let me bring us back to our normal view. So this is your picture right now. There are six of the items. I know you thought I was going to choose the surfboard, but I didn't. There are six items, and they are tall. And three are more up close, and three are farther away. So if you can spy those things, if you know what they are, raise your hand. So there's three tall ones and three short ones and they are tall. Raise your hand if you know what they are. Oh, a lot of you are raising your hands. You know, most of these are not natives. I think there is one type of native, but a lot of them are not. These are called, and I know you knew this, da -da -da -da, palm trees, P-A-L-M, palm trees, and there they are in the back. All right, so glad that you guys were here with me today. We're gonna to go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I'm going to just wish you all a great rest of your day. You all are junior rangers. You completed your program today. So you're going to wanna to go to the ports-ca.us website. Make sure that you always use the same email when you sign up for new junior ranger programs because every time you complete a program
program, you get a virtual badge, a Junior Ranger badge. And the more you collect, there will be other prizes, and you can find all of that information out on that website. So I have one more thing to share with you guys. Let me go to, hold on one second. You know what, I can't set this down. Give me one second, I've got to try to do this with my hands. It's coming. Stay with me. So I'm not sure if it's, this is sideways to you, and if it is, oh, let me try it one more time. There you go. So just so you can get a hold of us, take pictures of your nature necklace. If you have a chance to do that, I'm going to have to go really quick. So please go ahead and. Uh, take a picture of that if you want to reach out to us and find out more about other Junior Ranger programs and show us your nature necklace, all right? Guys, I got to go because I have another program uh, starting. So get that quick picture, and then we'll see you on another day. And I'm Interpreter Sandy saying goodbye, and thank you so much for joining us today at San Alejo. <laughs>